We're finally here. We finally did it. I finally got set up. I was late. <laughs> it's just what it is, all right? Welcome to the Room Middle Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Hartwell. With me today is Perry McAdrums. That's his uh, Instagram handle. Um, Perry McAdams, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Uh, you, you're actually the first installment of this series. So awesome. I don't know if you knew that or not. No, no. I'm honored. Yeah. It's good to have you. Thanks for messaging me to come on. And uh, yeah, we're here before our rehearsal um, for Brass Inferno. We're in, in Perry's rehearsal space. Yeah. Uh, looking at his drums right now. And it's an awesome Thomas Star Classic. Mm, Star Classic. It is. It is a Maple. Star Classic. Maple. Yep. yep. Um, t- tell people a little bit about your uh, like the bands that you're in. Like you're in, a, you're in quite a few tribute projects. You know, other other stuff like that. So. Yeah, uh, I usually have to pull up my Facebook to remember <laughs> all of them. But uh, yeah, I'm, I've been doing tribute stuff for um, years now. It's um, doing cover stuff for about ten years, um, and now the tribute stuff for the past six or seven years. Mm-hmm. And so uh, kind of got started doing um, Toology, doing a Tool tribute, and then branched off um, after I, I left that band, branched off into um, tributes for Tom Petty, which is kind of one of my main ones now, Stone Temple Pilots, The Cult, um, Alice in Chains most yep. recently. I love that one. Um, and it's just a lot of fun. Uh, I still am doing some original projects. I'm still doing the cover project uh, you know, with you. And um, and the original stuff is, is going good, too. Uh, working on some covers in my original band. In fact, one of my bands, we're going to do a cover of um, Boys in the Hood. Oh. The NWA song. You there know, you the go. Song. So we're working on that. Yeah. So I mean, you uh, you definitely know a ton of people on the scene here. Like, in the tribute scene, yeah. yeah. I, I'm trying to get to know more people that are just not in the tribute scene that are musicians. Yeah. I... I I came into this in a in a in this band. So Perry B- plays drums set, and I play pop per pop percussion stuff. Um, very well, I you. might add. Thank you. Uh, there is a very strong tribute scene in this city. Yeah. And coming back to my home city, being from being elsewhere for the past seven years, I had no idea. I always I was a kid, left, came back didn't have any idea of what the music scene was in Houston, but I, I've noticed there's a huge tribute scene. Yeah, and there's a big one in Vegas, too, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Which I did not know about until recently. Yeah, they have a lot of tribute shows, like productions. Um, uh, friend Charlie Gott, uh, Charlie, I think you listen to this, um, played on a Elvis show, uh, Heartbreak Hotel, I think, and then Ryan Harrison, who's been on the podcast before, played an Elvis show. Um uh, at Planet Hollywood. There's some original stuff, like, you know, like Cirque and everything, but you have the tribute shows that Cirque does, like, from Michael Jackson or um, uh, the Beatles, Mm. you know, stuff like that. But um, as far as, like, you know, original music, um, I don't know if I've met a ton of original bands. Uh, Maybe there's a friend of mine, Hunter Wilson, he's in a reggae dub group called Third Coast Roots Mm. um, that are based here. Um, but mostly I'm just meeting, you know, guys in the guys and gals in the tribute in the cover scene. So it's been really fun meeting people since I've been back. I mean, I kind of just jumped right into it. Well, not into it because of the not right into it because of the pandemic. But um, as soon as we saw kind of like a light get out of it, I started, you know, meeting more people like yourself and everybody else in the group. Um, so, you know, it's been it's been fun. It's been interesting to learn about like how this how this, like, um, it's such a huge city. I mean, I think we're, like, the fourth largest city in the United States. I still. think we might be third now. Third, yeah. Might I mean, be. we're expanding outwardly, so there's just so many drummers in this area. And yeah, and there's a lot of good ones in Houston. A lot of good ones. A lot of good drummers in Houston. There's a big Facebook group, multiple big Facebook groups um, for drummers. Uh, drummers of Houston is one I'm in. Uh, so I, the way I got into this group with you was um, Dwayne, the lead singer, I worked for his wife at a private school and oh, yeah, yeah. taught uh, percussion there part-time. And uh, he, he was looking for a percussionist. I was like, well, I guess, you know, I'm your guy. So 
here we are. And um, yeah, we were we were hard pressed to find somebody. We couldn't find anybody. And so I said, well, doesn't your doesn't your wife know people at the school? And he's like, oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that guy. Yeah. The uh, well, it's been a lot of fun being in this group. Um, and I, I have a good feeling. You know, like we have a good product going on here. And yeah, it's a really cool group. It is a cool group, and we're playing a lot of cool charts. Playing some Chicago, or playing some. Stevie Wonder. Uh, Stevie Wonder. Uh, Wonder. 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 Uh, Bruno Mars. All that good stuff. Yeah. Um, and but then yeah. Some one hit wonders like uh, like Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Uh, stuff. I mean, Blood, Sweat, and Tears is not a one hit wonder. Right. But there's. Some, some, I mean, not a lot of people know. There's songs that people, yeah. People Go Down do Gambling. Yeah, I've people never, don't know heard, these songs. never heard of that before. But yeah, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, I think, um, and just a little bit more about yourself you grew up here i grew up in houston yeah Yeah. um i graduated uh from high school and then i went to a religious jewish high school and so i graduated a year early and then i went and i lived in israel for a year you didn't tell me that i'm i just told it to you just now (laughs) that's cool yeah i didn't tell you that before yeah Uh, it it was cool and uh it was sort of like starting college early too because i went to college in israel and um, I, I had a great time, met lots of people, and people from all over the country, people yeah. from all over the world. And then um, when I came back, and, and I didn't play drums at all that year. And then when I came back, then I started going to colleges and stuff in, in Texas. Um, but I wasn't really playing drums when I went to a either. I went to a and for a year. And so it wasn't really something that I wanted to continue, just the academic side of it I wanted to be playing so I came to came back to Houston where I could play all the time and went to University of Houston went to HCC just took some classes at each um, and then eventually I started taking drum set lessons from a jazz guy who was actually he's a drummer but he was a really good piano player and so what he would do is he would teach me to comp he would play piano and then he would tell me what to play and what not to play. Interesting. And kind of teach me how to play with the, with the, you know, play improv. That's with somebody. valuable. Yes. Yeah. I've never, it's very rare, I feel like, to have a situation like that for a lesson teacher. You know? Yes. Yes. I felt so too. Um, and anyway, he helped me get into UNT. And so he told me, he, was, he encouraged me, hey, you're good enough. You should go try and do it. I'll help you. And so he did, and I did, and, and I got in. I went there for uh, four years. Did all my all my percussion stuff there, and then um, came back to Houston, and I've been just kind of living a double life in Houston ever since. Yeah, you know, trying to do the weekend warrior drumming stuff, and then at the same time have a day job. Yeah, which is realty. Which is real estate. Yeah. Yeah. So. So I do residential real estate. Um, if anybody needs a realtor, <laughs> I'm your Shameless man. Plug. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, and that's interesting too because. Um, I, I've I've chosen the path of being fully immersed in music, with yeah. teaching, and playing, and you know, uh, finding a teaching job is no small feat. Let me tell you, uh, and uh, you know, I the path that I chose was purely academic. Um, and it became that it wasn't ever a plan. It wasn't a plan until halfway through my senior year of high school, mm. uh, and even then, I was like, ah, we'll just see how it goes. I was never like the best student or anything. I've told this story a million times on here, but. It's uh, one of those things of where I I had to I needed that structure to you know get my act together, grow up a little bit, sure, and, or a lot of bit, sure, and you know get all that practice in and, and get to this point where I'm at now. But well, what was the point when you decided to be uh, teaching though? Well, uh, it's just always been a part of it. Like it came to me when I was 19. I was a tech. Um, for a drumline, a local drumline, Iowa High School outside of Lake Charles. And uh, it just kind of evolved from there. I went from teaching there for four years and doing camps here at other schools and doing that, teaching, doing drum corps and then teaching at the same drum corps I was at. So um, teaching percussion and band and stuff, I mean, I have a music education degree, so it's always been there. Mm. To be honest with you, it's never been the 100% goal. It's always been... to play you know be somewhere where you can play and and do it often and um and 
you start to realize, you know, like that's that's a pretty tough road unless, you know, especially recently when there's been no touring or anything like that. But, you know, as the world comes back, who knows what who knows what opportunities will, you know, present itself. But, uh, you know, I think I think when it comes to talking about that time that we just went through and you think of all those people that were fully immersed in playing full time Mm -hmm. and like that's kind of why I wanted to start this mental health series is because I I know I myself deal with anxiety and depression and which is really tough for some people to talk talk about which is why I made a Facebook post and was like if you're willing to talk about it you don't even have to talk about it in detail but if you're willing to talk about it you have an outlet let's talk kind of thing and you were one of the first people to message me yeah well I think it's great yeah. I think that people should talk about it people should know that there's people like them that want to help and yeah. uh, nobody's perfect and you know we're all going through stuff and you meet people every day you bump into people all day long and you always think or I always think something about them you know I yeah. always make an assumption or some kind of judgment right away without ever talking to them and yeah. the, th- the thing that I try to keep in mind is that I don't know what I think I know uh, about them and sometimes about myself, oftentimes about myself. And so I try to give everyone the benefit of the doubt, realize everybody's going through something that they're not talking about. Um, You know, even even friends, we see each other often and I I don't know everything that you're going through uh, because, you know, we don't talk about that all the time. It's cool that you want to, and so, yeah, I do want to be a part of this. I do want to encourage other people to talk about what they maybe feel that they can't talk about. Yeah, I mean, uh, and I was doing some research before, and there are a little bit, there's a few resources for musicians and with mental health issues. And we're not talking anything, it doesn't have to be anything drastic either. It can be like what I'm, you know, I, in some cases it is drastic, but like it's for anybody who feels like they they struggle you know there's a few resources but never heard of a podcast series and i could be wrong if somebody wants to send me a message of something that has gone along these lines but something to where people can audibly hear like we're, we're often reading people based on you know what they say and their actions but it it truly it truly means something to hear somebody explain in detail and take the time to be like this is what i struggle with I'm not sure if there's other people who struggle with it as well, you know. Um, I, I'm a firm believer in that I can hide my my struggles well, which is, that's that's a lifetime thinking that it's a weakness to talk about it. Right? That's a, gener- that's a uh, societal thing, right. because when people say, you know, be a man about it, yeah. man up, what they mean is shut up. Yeah, exactly. Don't tell anyone what you're feeling yeah. and just pretend that everything's okay and that you're stronger than whatever you're feeling. Yeah. It's like a strange stigma. I do think the stigma is shifting. I think it's becoming more, it's becoming more and more okay to talk about things like this. Yeah. Um, and look, the reason why I started this series and I'm glad you're the first guest to be on it. Um, because I, I was had a really bad bout with anxiety recently and it involved decision, a, a big decision involving my career and everything. And um, ultimately, I, I do believe I made the right decision. But uh, there's been so many instances where that anxiety is triggered by something that I know it's coming, and yet I still can't deal with it. And so I'm still, I'm, I'm just sick and tired of dealing with it in a sense of I'm, I'm now making the for real steps to to get help and to try to understand where it came from and why it happens right and uh i wanted to start this series to document that progress but also hear from other people and how they deal with it or what they deal with um how they went about fixing it if they have fixed it although i mean like i'm not sure if you can really fix anything but you learn how to cope in the the correct way instead of like just distracting yourself. Like yeah, working just, through it. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's just the opposite of, of not giving it any, paying it any attention. What what struggles have you dealt with? So, the the one that's the hardest for me, and it, and it encompasses everything. It goes through every aspect of my life. Is adjustment. 
yep. and, and the dread of changing to fit something else that's changing in my life. So for instance, um, joining a new band, okay? It's a great thing. It's awesome, especially when everybody in the band is cool and you like them and you want to be playing music with them. I always make it harder on myself than it needs to be. Um, and even in the case where I already know the material and it's not, a, it's not a matter of wondering, oh no, can I play it? Oh no, do I have enough time to learn the material so that I can play it right? Even when I do know all the material and none of that is an issue, I still dread the change in my life. Yeah. And having to be at a certain place once a week or to show up on time and to worry, what are these people going to think if I, you know, if I bring water versus beer, <laughs> you know, or like, what are they going to say if I, if I want to change something about the song and don't want to do it exactly like the record. And these kinds of things are toxic that I do to myself. Yeah. Nobody's making me feel that way. Nobody's making me think those things, but I do it to myself. And then more often than not, in almost every single case, none of that stuff ends up mattering. Um, and it just becomes this huge amount of burden that I place on myself, all to what I think is a productive end to, you know, be good, to play well, and to sound good. It's good intentions behind it. It's good it. intentions behind it, right. But the way that I go about it is not always very healthy. And uh, that's that kind of kicks off all my other struggles. Yeah, um, it's just a classic case of what of what I deal with too, in a sense of uh, dreading change. And it could be minuscule. It could be the fact that my, you know, an example would be a favorite restaurant closing, and now I got to find it. You know, it's like so. It can be very, very minuscule, and it's exhausting that way because. Now you're thinking every time you got you want to join a new group, you're like, God, I got to go through this whole process of emotions again, yes. which is exactly what I just dealt with, and I still am dealing with a little bit because it's still fresh. Um, that whole process is, for lack of a better term, exhausting. It is exhausting. Yeah, it is daunting, and it it takes up time that you could be spending on other things. Yeah, um, even if it's just in your head, you could be thinking about other things. You know, planning your day or thinking about who you can call like to help them out you know mental energy is mental energy yeah it's it's a commodity yeah it's a precious commodity it is and um and i think with in in my situation um i was facing a, a fork in the road i was facing uh a go to a place where i don't really want to go and be by myself and deal with these issues um and restart again uh, or stay where I'm at and try to build off of what I already have and not have to be by myself and deal with these issues um, that fork in the road causes so much so much tension and uh, anxiety in my mind that I have to then so I, I, I actually remember the moment it set in and I remember thinking to myself this is going to be a rough few days because it's, it's that and it's that powerful. Mm -hmm. And when I ultimately made the decision to not go down that road of being by myself and everything, I immediately felt better. But then there's a sense of like, do I feel better because I know I don't have to go down this hard road? Or do I feel better because I'm not feeling the anxiety and anxiety anymore? And then you start to have anxiety about was this did decision? I make the right did decision? I make the right decision? Yeah. And it's an exhausting carousel of just like, I'm feeling terrible, tense, I'm going to go cry for a sec. And then you get around to the other side of the carousel and you're like, I feel relaxed, it's a beautiful day. Uh, I'm going to go hug my dog, just a little bit extra. And then, oh shit, okay, we're back. And, yeah. you know, so that's what I deal with. And after Googling, doing a lot more research than I have before, it sounds like, okay, this may be a little bit more severe than I thought. So... Which in, immediately I made that Facebook post. I'm like, let's. There's got to be other people dealing with this like I am, and they need to talk about it. You know. Yeah, um, and sometimes we don't look at uh, the decisions that we don't make in the right way. Yeah. Uh, sometimes that can amount to the feeling of loss. Yeah. Now, certainly, 
actually, you know, somebody dying or losing a loved one or, or a breakup or something like that, those things are loss. Those things are real loss. But sometimes when we go down a road and we let the other one not be the road that we are traveling, we can feel a sense of loss for that possibility. Uh, yep. Yeah. But here's this whole path that I've lost the opportunity to go down now because I've chosen the other path. And that in and of itself can be even without the remorse. You know, we call it in real estate when people buy yeah, something and then they remorse, yeah. buyer's remorse, you know, I mean, not just real estate, but yeah, um, it's a similar thing when you're just making any decision. Yeah. You always want to think that you know everything. I mean, we as humans, we all want to know everything. And, you know, of course, if you could live your life again, knowing what you know now, you know, you would. But that's just not the way it works. And so we have to learn to push forward and keep looking to the future instead of living in the past and looking at the past and thinking, what if? And instead of thinking what could have been, we should strive to think what can be and make something good out of what we do have or what mm -hmm. we can get, that type of thing. And it's tough. I'm not, I don't have an answer to how best to do it necessarily, but I'll tell you what, drumming helps me. Oh, drumming. I, I, <laughs> When I made my decision, the, the I I went to my practice space and I just played and I was like, oh my god, I feel so much better. Because it's like meditation. It's it is meditation, and you but not everybody. You know, I think musicians have that outlet. Um, yes. And some people, some people actually may not feel that meditation all the time with their instrument. I know, like, I know sometimes I even get um, uh, feeling like I'm in a monotonous process of like. My God, I gotta work on this. I know it's not good. I just don't want to work on it, but I have to, you know. Like whether it's independence work or tone or something, and you know, there's also an anxiety in when when you're about to make a decision or a life change, and you're thinking about too far down the road for each direction. Mm. You're thinking way too, like this is all the negative stuff that could happen, oh, and, yeah, and yeah. this is all this is all that I would be. I could experience. There's no guarantee I would experience, but I could experience this. There's a high chance you start thinking about percentages, and you. It's just fear. A, it's a classic case of overthinking. You it's know. Fear. Yeah, it's fear. Not the fear of the unknown. Yeah. Not knowing what you're gonna get. Yeah, absolutely. That is pervasive. I feel that all the time. Yeah. That's the struggle too. <laughs> and, and you know, like, I th I understand change is inevitable um everybody goes through life changes um but some changes are significantly heftier than others i mean in your experience like you know you like you're probably experiencing that right now and then like in and i know i am and uh while we do have these small changes that we don't even think about in our day-to-day -day or like you know year to year month to month even um, there's just some that just stick with you and like that can lead to dwelling on it and, and suffering through it. And it's, uh, it's the term I keep thinking of is exhausting. Yeah. It, that kind of thing is exhausting. Um, I'll tell you about a major change in my life that happened recently. Well, it's, it was a year, uh, two, two days ago, it was a year. So in the middle of the pandemic, um, June, uh, we're all at home, you know, we're all working from home and stuff or hopefully working, you know, depending on your situation. And we worked at um, Martha Turner Sotheby's. That was the brokerage that my boss and I uh, worked at. And she was there for 20 something years. I was with her there at that brokerage for eight. And so that was the first place that I ever did real estate. I knew everybody that worked there. I was friends with the president and vice president. Um, just everything about it felt like a family, felt like home. And my boss started fielding calls from the competition and they wanted to recruit her. And it was a long negotiation process, but eventually she brought me in to start discussing the negotiations with her. And um, I didn't want to go. And I told her pretty adamantly for a long time, and uh, she decided against um, listening to me. Mm. I mean, we went anyway. Because I, I did tell her that I wanted to stay with her no matter if she 
state or she goes, I'm not trying to quit or um, I'm not trying to give ultimatums or anything like that, right. you know. Um, so in the end, we did go, and it's been a year now. And at first, we never went to the office. And uh, we just continued everything from home, and it was a huge adjustment. Um, I mean, we still do the same job. We still do the same work. But the back end, which is my entire job, and how the processes work behind the scenes, all that was different. All that's changed, and I had to learn a whole new system. And that's been my whole year this past year. And then at the same time, try to recover from this pandemic where for a little while there, nobody was looking at houses, nobody's buying houses, nobody's selling houses because you can't let anybody in your house. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to go outside to go look at your house. So it was, it was really an uncertain time. Things are not like that now. Uh, in the real estate industry. It is relatively back to normal. Um, but anyway, that was one thing that I have struggled with for a year now. And uh, we just had our anniversary and we said to each other, like, wow, like it's still, we still don't know everything about being here yeah. at, at this new place. We're still struggling with trying to get it done. But the emotional side of it is not something that I talk to her about my boss the emotional side of it is not really something I talk to anybody about because it's it's kind of nobody's business I guess in a way yeah you know in a way and uh in the other way I I feel like I don't really like you said earlier like um like when I was saying like it's when people man up you know like you're not supposed to talk about it and that's not true how did, how did your boss handle it the, is the same way she you know. put a lot of it on me okay. is how she handled it she figured well it's the same from her perspective she figured well it's the same for me I'll just have make sure Perry knows he needs to do this different and do that different do that different and then at the same time I'm doing half of her job and I have to do this whole other job and now I've got to learn all these new things too and anyway she didn't really deal with it at all she just kind of gave it to me to deal with so I talk to uh, my friends about it um, as often as I can, I guess, but it's just not often. Uh, I talk to Drew about it sometimes. You know, we're friends. We hang yeah. outside of practice and stuff. And I, I've talked to him about it. He's a, he's a, he's a great guy. He's a good friend. And, um, and uh, you, you've turned out to be a really cool, oh, thanks, cool friend. Man. Yeah, well, I, I, I definitely, uh, from the very beginning when you meet somebody, you can tell, like, if you know, you're going to be pals with them or not. And that's definitely the case with you. And so it's, uh, the reason I asked if why, how your boss dealt with it is because, um, I know when I have a friend who literally jumps around, like he'll do like month to month Airbnb, like he'll jump around all over the place. And, um, and like that amount of flip flopping and being other places and doing this kind of like not being committed to one thing mm. really, I don't, I don't vibe with that. It takes a toll on you. Because de so there's hats. people who don't deal with anything we're talking about. Like, I think everybody has a little bit of something, but, like, there's there's people out there that legitimately make a decision, like, all right, we'll see what happens, and think nothing of it. They just don't have to worry about it. Yeah. That's bizarre. It's bizarre to me, too. Yeah, I've, I always ponder that. I'm like, <laughs> how? Like, I... I Maybe they're on drugs. I don't know. I, don't, I talked to that same guy the other night, and I was like, have you ever dealt with any of these families? No. Wow. What? What? <laughs> like, you know, like, how did I get, how do I get this brain? You get that brain. Yeah, I mean, anxiety feels just like a daily part of my life. Same. You know, I don't, um, I don't know my severity in relation to others, but it certainly is, is uh, something that I have to try to keep at bay. Yeah. You know, and mitigate it so that it doesn't overtake me. Yeah, I mean, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> like, I always feel like I'm trying to distract myself, which is, again, exhausting. You know, you're, like, always trying to, like... It's like somebody who has ringing in their ears. We know a lot of those people who, mm -hmm. like, got to have a fan on or something, like, to, to cancel out that, that ringing in yeah. the ear. And in my case, I have both. <laughs> so uh, I have both the, I have, you know, I, I have to find something in the day to think about or, you know, be a, almost be obsessed about. I mean, I'm still obsessed with playing and playing drums and practicing drums. 
I'm obsessed with golf. You know, I'm always playing. I'm always thinking about golf, watching golf, golf videos. I did not know that about you. Yeah, yeah, big golf. Uh, been playing since I was a kid. So, um, you find yourself like almost uh, getting obsessed with a couple different things to mitigate to to find some kind of escape. Which both of those things for me are an escape. Like truly, I remember. A couple of days ago, I was at the driving range, and I was like, I know if I'm here, I'm worried about golf. You know, I know as soon as I pick up that club and take the first swing, it's working on my golf game. And as soon as I get back in the car, I know everything else is going to come rushing back in. And I was 100% right. Mm-hmm. Which I'm a little, I, I am proud of the fact that I know I can predict my process. You know, sometimes it comes unexpected um, as far as like the severe cases, like the recent one, but. Um, but other than that I, I am proud of the fact that I do know my process but I would still like to know where it came from was there some kind of event in my life that triggered my brain to process things this way I don't I think I do remember as a kid having issues like this maybe um, it's just hard to you know pick out so yeah um, everybody's got you know things in their past that are difficult to process and deal with. Um, my parents were divorced when I was young, when I was three, and so I was raised by my mom. Um, and, uh, you know, my dad was around, but he didn't have custody, so we didn't see him all the time. And, uh, you know, lots of things branch off from that. Um, spent a lot of time alone with my brother yeah. when I was a young kid. You know, some of that was good, some of that was bad. Um, my mom was always exhausted coming home, and that amounts to, you know, some, some difficult decisions for her uh, while still trying to raise the kids, trying to pay for everything and do everything. So, you know, things come from that over time. Um, but my mom is actually a great example of how to kind of turn that around because she has spent her whole life sort of in the service of other people intentionally. Mm. You know, she raised me and my brother. And then when my brother had his kids, my mom raised those kids too. Um, I mean, she certain they they certainly had help from their mother and their father, who were also divorced. But my mom was a big part of their lives and still is. Yeah. And uh, nowadays, I would say I have a, a a relationship with my nephews because my mom tries so hard, you know, to bring us all together all the time. So my point is just that it takes somebody who. You, you have to look at the bright side, you know, and force yourself. And it's not just a matter of looking at it, but walking towards it. Mm. And that's that's what my mom's taught me in that regard. That it takes she, action. It takes action. Because otherwise thinking about what the bright side is, is just sometimes it's just not enough. Right. You know? And like, I, uh, for instance, like, did you have any doubts about going to Israel? Did you have any, like, what was that experience like? With knowing, kind of getting to know what your thought process is. What was that like for you? So I was kind of, um, I was kind of scared to go, but I was also really happy to get out of the house at such a young age. I was mm. seventeen. Okay. When I went over there, so not even old enough to do, you know, certain things here. Was this part of your requirements for the? They, we had options, but what they wanted was some kind of um, religious study. Okay. And so I could do that and go to uh, university at the same time at the particular school that I chose to do. And yeah. so, so getting uh, getting over there was a matter of more like what you said, <clears throat> that you don't understand how the guys just brush it off. That was how my mentality was when I was 17. I just ignored anything that was an emotion about it, and it was such a driving force in my head to get out of the house early and go do something completely on my own. It felt like an adventure. And it, and it was to a certain extent. So you, you didn't feel any of like, oh man, I'm not going to be able to see my parents. I'm not going to be able to see family. I'm not going to do... You didn't think any of that at that time? No, I didn't. Mm. What I did think is once I was actually on the plane and I started going, it hit me like a sack of bricks. I don't have any friends. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to know anybody. I don't know what to do. And uh, lucky for me, I made friends on the plane. And um, so that was because somebody else t- 
took action to, to have a relationship with me out of the blue. Mm-hmm. And that started teaching me to do that with people. Yeah. And sometimes taking action is just saying words. Right. You know, um, I don't have a terribly close relationship with my father. I don't see him all that often. But when I do see him and when I do talk to him on the phone or text him, I tell him I love him. And that's not something that I used to do when I was younger. Mm. That's something that I made a conscious decision to, to try to do as often as possible. Same thing with my brother. You know, I didn't always have that exchange when I was little, but I take it upon myself to have that exchange now. And I think it's for, for the better. It, it's a healing type of thing. It is, yeah. I, I, can, I can relate um, in a sense of uh, almost exactly that. I mean... It's just kind of like everybody's situation is so different. You always compare yourself so to yourself to like people who like all they do is say I love you to their family. You know, like every after everything they, they, they say, granted. yeah, and uh, provides a different perspective later on. Especially and you know, honestly, I, all this all this just contributes in some way to the way we process things and um, people sure. who people have different degrees of traumatic experiences that um, that contribute to to like the way they process things as, a, as an adult I used to always think everybody had these feelings about change or whatever you know the world would be a much better place I think yeah. if everybody did have those also people would never go anywhere <laughs> people would all I mean like I had a I was just telling him when I came in, I had a run in with this guy at the gas station he, well it wasn't even a run in, he was like hey you cut me in line, I was like all right, and I left. Like he was continuing to talk and say some things, but uh, I was just like, "Well, the world's back for one thing." Yeah. And but you know, you events like that, the way I process things, I I do get a little anxiety about that. Like, oh man, I, this could. If I thought that, I thought about that, you know, happening. Of course, I will in the next few times I go in a gas station or wherever. I'm like, oh, I could <laughs> you know run into somebody like that again. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, the main thing why I pressed record and, you know, I want to get this series going is because I need to, We everybody who comes on needs to process things, I need to process things, and somebody who hears the way we process things is going to uh, benefit from hearing, like, oh, this, I deal with that, oh, I don't deal with that, but, you know, I know somebody who does kind of thing, you know, so... I definitely think it's uh, it's going to help a lot of people. I, at least I hope so, you know. I mean, but uh, when it comes to wrapping up that Israel experience, I'm just curious out of, out of my own curiosity. Um, you're there for a calendar year. Yeah, August to August. University, you're going to university there. What was it like wrapping up that process and having to adjust back to was that a, that's a life change in itself. that was a life change that was way harder yeah I, I developed such an identity over there um, that felt like it was new and coming back I was arrogant I was uh, rude to my parents I was um, I felt so independent and I didn't know how to deal with that I didn't know how to process that I felt like I didn't need anybody (laughs) I didn't have a job my parents were paying for everything you know but I had this sense of entitlement from being over there and being uh, just sort of on my own so it was a huge adjustment and I really had to learn that was the first time in my life that I really had to learn how to really adjust Uh, and that what I thought isn't always so just because I think it doesn't make it so are the cultures drastically different no um there's some key differences everything shuts down friday afternoon uh everybody works on sunday okay yeah the work week starts on sunday in israel okay um but it's sort of like a weekly national holiday the sabbath okay yeah everything shuts down friday night um and then everything's closed on saturday Um, interesting yeah uh but um, it's an Americanized country, you know. They, they're a democracy. They uh, invent a lot of cool stuff that we use over here. Yeah. Uh, very advanced society, um, and everybody's usually pretty nice. Um, learning the language was was cool. I mean, I grew up learning Hebrew. Yeah, of course. Um, so it wasn't hard to understand, but it was hard to speak fluently. 
and so I had to work at that to get that up. But did you get it fluent? Uh, by the time I came back, it was pretty fluent. Yeah, yeah, what about it was now? twenty years ago. So, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> um, yeah. but uh, that was definitely. I'm glad you asked that actually, because that was definitely a huge moment in my life, a huge adjustment yeah. in my life to try to to learn how to deal with things. And um, you know what? It one of the things that it taught me about how to deal with things is that I respond to the meditative process, as I think most people do, drumming working out, sitting still, focus, focusing on your breathing. Um, I, I've not been in the military before, but they teach you how to fall asleep. Um, and that's, you, you have to give your, your monkey brain, your dumb brain, you know, something to do, something to focus on. And so that's really what meditation is, is focusing on your breathing. It's not thinking of nothing, you know, same thing with drumming. When you're, and I know you know this, uh, but this is just for the people watching, you know, when you're working on a part and you know how the part goes, you're just trying to make sure that it's clean and it's tight, you're playing it right. You're not not thinking about it and just going over the motions. You're actually focusing on it really intensely. And so that type of thing helps me work through things, mm -hmm. even when I don't even know that I'm doing it. Right. I go for a run almost every day now, I didn't used to, but I go for a run almost every day now. And um, that is so meditative because I am literally just focusing on my breathing, making sure that I continue to breathe. Uh, you know, we only have two minutes to live, but the timer resets every time we take a breath. <laughs> Jesus. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, it's great. So, so, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I think about um, when I'm really worried about something or and I'm really being eaten up by something, I go to my meditative process, working out, drumming, um, or just sitting still and trying to breathe and calm down. I, I just want to, that's great that you said that because I was reading on that and not really understanding what my meditative process was until recently. Well, I've always known it's been meditative for me to play, but I've, I've just played so much over the past however long it's been we both have that it just almost becomes part of life you yeah. know sometimes it's hard to escape on it sometimes you yeah know? um it becomes a job sometimes and in your case it is it's stressful you know like you gotta learn parts you gotta learn i got three gigs this weekend i gotta learn and especially in your case we got all these covers and everything and you know you're trying to respect the parts as much as you can sure um which you know we could do a whole podcast on that but next time next time um but yeah, I'm glad you said that because you know, I hope everybody is like, especially with people who deal with the crippling stuff like I do, finding your meditative process is key. And like I said, I played immediately felt better when I was drumming. It was almost instantaneous when I was at the driving range, whatever. So uh, I think that in itself is powerful, you know. So I'm glad I could help with that. Yeah. <laughs> and if anybody else has any questions about how to go about that, yeah. contact me or Josh and or real estate. Yeah. So I can help with that. All right. Well, thanks, Perry, so much for coming on. Thank you for having me, Josh. Yeah, absolutely. That's another episode of the Ruminal Podcast. You can follow along on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Uh, there's like a, a Google Podcast. There's like six other ones. Thanks to anchor.fm uh, for hosting the podcast. And uh, also, you can follow my stuff at www.heartwelldrums.com. All my socials are Heartwell Drums. Follow Perry on Instagram. Find him on Facebook. Or Everything is at MacAd Drums. M A C A Drums. Yep. And you can find him gigging with The Last Dance, Brass Inferno, or Stone. What's Some, Stone? some Temple Pilots. Some Temple Pilots. It, all those guys. Allison Chains. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. But yeah, thanks again, man. That's it for this one. We'll see you next time.